Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll find Philippians chapter 1 in your Bible, the text for this morning that the Holy Spirit would have us consider runs from verse 27 to verse 30. It's actually one sentence in the language in which Paul wrote it. It comes in a couple of sentences as it translates into English. Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 27, the subject matter the Holy Spirit calls to our attention through this text is stick together. That last song, The Church's One Foundation, is uh, the perfect illustration of this passage. There was one line in there that said, the Lord will defend her, talking about the church, but the church must stick together. Paul writing from a Roman prison under house arrest where he was falsely imprisoned, he writes to the congregation at Philippi, a congregation which he founded and which supported him financially throughout his ministry. Verse 27, he speaks, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as the secular forces of this world bear down upon your church, local and universal, help your church to stick together, come what may. We know you will because your promise is that the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. And so we call upon that promise On this day, in the name of our preeminent one, the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Speaking of sticking together, we took our children to Disney World when they were young. At the time, we had four young children. Three of them could walk. One was in a stroller. For the three that could walk, what we did is we had these harnesses, for lack of a better term, But I'll describe one for you. It was almost like a backpack, but it was actually, instead of a backpack on the back, it was a monkey. And the tail of the monkey extended out, which turned into a leash for the parent. And as we walked around Disney World, we had our leashes in hand and our stroller in hand. It it was very interesting. There were some of the tourists there who felt like we were cruel for doing that. And there were some who offered to purchase for a high price the very harnesses we were using. Shows you the the complex at Disney World. We had a single motive though. We wanted our family to stick together. In a similar way, Paul's motive for the Philippian saints in this paragraph is that they stick together as a family. In this section, Paul began transitioning away from his situation in a house arrest. He was giving them an update up until now, really. And he begins to transition to their situation. When we look at this section, it cannot be understood properly apart from its spiritual context. What do you mean? Paul recognized God's godly offspring everywhere are engaged in the same spiritual war in which Paul was engaged. The battles might look different in different places and they certainly did look different in Philippi, but the strategy is always the same, to divide God's people through three 
things, discord, fear, and persecution. Verses 27 through 30 are all one sentence in Greek. It's 82 words if I counted correctly, 15 verbs. I'm not a great counter, I may be one or two off, but you get the idea. Yet everyone agrees the controlling verb is the first one. Let your manner of life be worthy. All that in English is actually one word in the Greek language. And then two other verbs unfold what that means or what that looks like. The verb, you are standing firm in verse 27. And then the verb, striving side by side in verse 27. And after that, Paul makes a conclusion, expect to suffer. So in guiding you through Paul's thought, because I'm not here to present what I believe or what I want to say. I'm just trying to follow what God wrote through the apostle Paul. But here's how it breaks out live distinctly from the world system by standing firm, by striving side by side. And then the second main point, expect to suffer when you do that. So let's follow him out. Live distinctly from the world. Verse 27a, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Here we find that controlling verb that I mentioned, let your manner of life be worthy. The root word of that verb is in Greek is polis, and it comes to us in English in words like metropolis or a city. And what he's talking about is citizenry. Some scholars even suggest that Paul was appealing to the patriotism in Philippi. We know many military officers would retire to Philippi, and it's almost as if Paul said, just as your citizenship to Rome is important, remember also, you have an even higher allegiance to Christ's kingdom. And I might add by point of application, just as your citizenship to the United States is important, remember also, you have an higher allegiance to Christ's kingdom than you do to the United States of America. He will make that idea explicit in chapter 3, verse 20. He says something like, but our citizenship is in heaven. But here he says you are to live worthy, and he's talking about as kingdom citizens. The question becomes, live worthy of what? Worthy of morals? worthy of ethics, worthy of societal expectations, or something else. He says, worthy of the gospel of Christ. You see, the good news is that God in Christ rescued us from this wicked world system. We saw four instances of that in our baptism. These are individuals whom God rescued from the world system's way of thinking and planted them firmly in the kingdom of his son. And we know that to do that, Christ satisfied God's wrath against their sin by dying on a cross as a perfect substitute and rising from the dead to declare them righteous based upon their belief in his promise. The least they can do, the least you can do, and the least Paul was saying the Philippians could do is live righteously for him. He's done all of that for you. The least we could do is live righteously. The great Baptist John Gill felt righteous living pertained first to congregational life and secondly It extended to righteous behavior of the individual toward the outside world. That is, grateful kingdom citizens plan their schedules around the congregation's events. The world's children plan their schedules around the world's events. Gracious kingdom citizens place supreme value on attending the preaching of the gospel. The world's children place supreme value on attending political functions, theater, sports, and the like. Grateful kingdom citizens observe the gospel ordinances and the gospel calendar. The world's children observe 
cultural norms and cultural calendars. Now let me just pause to say, too often Christians today look more like the world than they do like Christ's kingdom citizens. There's a problem because this is calling us to something different. We begin to reimagine worth or a worthy life in terms of worldly expectations. We let the world define what living worthy means. Christians even today debate genuinely how much we should engage Satan's world system versus how much we should remain distinct from it. The interesting thing about this debate is as society degenerates, as society increases in wickedness, they force Christ's congregations to increase in distinctiveness. I don't know if you've realized, we don't live in a Christian culture anymore. We've exited a Christian era and we have entered into a post-Christian era in Western society. Christianity is being redefined or rejected altogether by the pagan culture. And the lines of distinction are being drawn, not by the church, but by the culture. You must decide in these times, will you, like Israel of old, follow the ways of the pagan cultures surrounding you, or worse, create a culture to your own liking, or will you stick together with those whom God has called out of paganry and hold to certain immutable standards of truth revealed in his word? That's a choice that you will have to make today, one way or the other. Live distinctly from the world system. This is what Paul is saying. A life manner, uh, living a, your life in a manner worthy of the gospel is different than living your life worthy in a manner worthy of pleasing the cultural milieu. How do you do that? He moves into a sub point. You do it by standing firm, verse 27b says. He says, so that I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind. The emphasis uh, verb here is standing firm. John MacArthur notes that it was used of a soldier who stood his ground even to the death. Stand firm. Stand firm against what? In Paul's context here, he was speaking of standing firm against the wicked world system. During the formation of this very congregation to whom he writes at Philippi, Acts chapter 16 documents that spiritual, secular, legal, and governmental forces were bearing down on them. Spiritually, you might remember, Paul encountered a a slave girl who was possessed by a demon. Spiritual activity was high in Philippi. You might remember that Uh, Secular-wise, the wealthy slave girl's masters conspired against Paul and Silas, even assaulting them physically. Legally and governmentally, the judicial system beat Paul, they beat Silas with rods, and they falsely imprisoned them. In addition to all of these forces within the world system, Paul mentions that Jewish legalists currently were active in Philippi, not only active, but agitating the saints and disrupting their faith. He'll talk more about that in chapter three. Against all of these wicked forces, it was imperative that the congregation not cater to those wicked forces, but rather stand firm against them. Specifically in two areas, gospel doctrine, and gospel conviction. Paul uses the term one spirit and one mind, gospel doctrine and gospel conviction. That word spirit is the Greek word pneumatai, which Calvin correctly denotes as understanding. 
one spirit. He's talking about one understanding. The human spirit cannot stand firm unless it understands gospel truth and gospel doctrine. You must understand truth. Truth, doctrine, is the summarization of our body of beliefs. We were born sinners in Satan's kingdom of darkness. That's the bad news. But God translated a people from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his light by faith alone and Christ alone. That's good news. And of course, there are more details wrapped up in it than that regarding conversion. But this is Paul's summation of it in his previous letter, Colossians 1 verse 13. Gospel doctrine and gospel conviction. This is described by Paul as the mind. It's the Greek word suke, and you can hear psyche or psychologist come through. That's where we get those words is suke. He's talking about Paul's uh, use of the mind here. This word psyche reaches deep down into the brain stem of human beings to inform a person's core convictions, attitudes, and ultimately their actions. Our convictional fortitude, attitudes, and actions must be united in the gospel. So you see, live distinctly from the world. What does that mean? It means you stand firm against their ideals and for Christ's ideals. Can I pause for just a moment and give some commentary on the current state of affairs? We formerly lamented that we as Christians have done a poor job in our messaging. The watching world knows more about what we are against than what we are for. I'm beginning to reassess that lamentation. I'm beginning to understand the watching world knows exactly what we are for. And they have drawn distinct lines in the sand, battle lines, to see if Christians will stick together or fracture. Sadly, we aren't sticking together. We as evangelical Christians, whatever that term means, are more concerned with offending the pagan culture's definitions like equality and justice than we are in offending God's divine dictates. This is a problem. When we are more interested in pleasing the wicked pagan culture than we are the pristine and pure holiness of God. That's a problem. And Paul is commenting on it. I'll give you a practical case in point. The United Methodist Church, historically a strong Protestant witness, has had a come apart long in the making. In 1956, they voted purely based on the Western society's definition of equality and justice to allow women to be pastors and deacons. That vote had nothing to do with women. In fact, they used women for greater motives. It's very sad what they did. Just last week, they officially redefined marriage according to the Western pagan culture's definition, and they voted to ordain gays and lesbians to be pastors and deacons too. They used women to get to that end, but that isn't the end. The next step is to allow transgenders to be pastors. Why? Because the arguments regarding equality and justice are exactly the same. Never mind what Holy Scripture says. Never mind how God has ordered His church through the writings of holy men of old. Never mind these things. These secular pressures are designed to create disorder and worse, to draw clear battle lines. Yes, the world knows exactly what we stand for. And the world knows exactly what we are against and they are pressing that issue aggressively. Spiritually, these lines are drawn to determine if God's godly offspring will stick together 
or will be more interested in being accepted by sinners yet dead in their trespasses and sins. Each time I go to the beach, I do something no one else really knows about. I will stand in the waters of the ocean and I will dig my heels deep into the sand. It's a game between me and the Atlantic Ocean. And small though I am, I dig my heels very deep. The Atlantic tries to crash me over this way with ferocious waves and it tries to pull me yet the other way with undertoes in the opposite direction. The Atlantic Ocean doesn't care which way I go, it just wants me to fall down. Christ's congregations must dig their heels into the foundation of Christ. Their stances will aggravate the powerful currents of this world system. We know that from the start. Nevertheless, the answer is not to give way to the currents. The answer is to dig our heels deep into gospel concrete now, today, in order to stand firm. What exactly does that entail? Planting your feet in gospel concrete. Well, we move to our next sub point. It means striving side by side. Verse 27c says, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. The next verb of emphasis, side by side, striving side by side. John MacArthur explains it as a compound word made up of soon, which means together, and athleo, which is, means athlete or to compete. So it's, it's building this idea of teamwork. You are arm in arm, and indeed you even see some uh, football teams walk out of their tunnel and they'll be arm in arm. What are they doing? They're, they're creating a show of force. We are together. We are united and nothing will break our spirit. In a certain sense, we are a team here, this congregation and all congregations like ours. We are arm in arm. And in a certain sense, we're in a team competition, but it's, it's weightier than that. It's, it's a battle royale. It's, it's not fun and games. It's a war. It's a spiritual war. We are in this war together. We only win the war by staying side by side in gospel doctrine and gospel conviction. And just like any team that you might have played on or been a part of, Sometimes our emotions get the better of us and we begin to fight amongst each other rather than fight our common foe. This was beginning to happen in Philippi. If you flip to chapter 4 verse 2, there were two women who had fractured their relationship. We don't know what it was over, but th there was some discord there. We've all watched it happen in our local congregations and in the larger scope of Christianity. We've seen, even in recent days, charismatics versus cessationists. We've seen Calvinists versus Arminians. We've seen Christian nationalism versus separation of church and state. We've seen amillennialists versus postmillennialists versus premillennialists. We've seen regulative worship styles versus normative worship styles. And the whole deal is designed to put people into divisions and then peel them off one by one. All of those things are important. All of those things can reach a level where they divide us. Paul warned against that. He warned against creating strife among Christendom where our focus is on tearing each other apart rather than tearing our common foe apart. The best witness to our common foe is unified strength. Paul noted in verse 28, this is a clear sign to them of their destruction. In other words, if they can't divide us, they can't defeat us. Live 
separately and distinctly from the world system. Do it by standing firm and by striving side by side with other Christians. And he was talking to a congregation, so we'll apply it to in this congregation. And then Paul makes a final conclusion. If you do that, expect to suffer. Don't expect it to all be roses and sunshine. Expect to suffer. Verse 29. For if it had been grant for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him but also suffer for his sake. Listen to what that's saying. It has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him but also suffer for his sake. A congregation that sticks together presents an existential threat to Satan. He will attack that congregation. They will suffer. Let me pause momentarily to point out something that is not the main thrust of this text, but it is theologically important, and it bothers a lot of people, frankly. Namely this, belief in Christ is granted by God, not generated by sinners. Did you hear what he says here? It has been granted not only that you believe, but also that you suffer. I pause to make that point for this reason. Just as belief, saving faith, is granted to you by God, so also is a certain measure of suffering granted to you by God. In other words, no one begs for God to send suffering into their life. I don't know that I've known anyone that ever prayed, God, please allow me to suffer, send more suffering, make me hurt. God simply sends it. He grants it to each individual, to each congregation. He grants it for a purpose, and oftentimes those purposes remain unknown to us. He simply does it. Live distinctly from the world by standing firm, by striving side by side, and expect to suffer. It may take different forms, but expect to suffer. What is the single timeless principle? If we were to take this one passage of Scripture and reduce it to a sentence, it would be this. Congregations must live distinctly from the world by standing firm and sticking together. Congregations must live distinctly from the world by standing firm and sticking together. How is that done? It's done when each of you determine in your own heart, no matter what the world is saying, no matter how they're defining things, no matter if I lose my job, no matter if I I lose my family, no matter what I lose, I will stand firm with this congregation and I will stick together with this congregation and what they stand for in gospel truth and gospel conviction. When James asked each of those four Believers whom God has called out in the baptistry. Have you laid down your life, taken up your cross, and will you chase after Jesus all the days of your life? And they all said yes. It takes great courage to do that in a post-Christian society. Because when you lay down your life and you take up your cross and you chase after him, You are running the opposite way that the world is running. You will draw attention to yourself. You won't have to agitate. Your direction will draw attention. You will become an easy target because you will look so different and think so different than they look and that they think. And you can expect persecution because when people see and are convicted, They typically don't change apart from the work of the Spirit in their life. They typically go ad hominem attacks, which means they attack the man. They attack the woman. So we can expect suffering. Now, given that principle and given the fact that you and I and our congregation are easy targets now, we've chosen to chase Christ and not the things of this world. 
Allow me to ask three questions in closing. First, are there changes you need to make to strive side by side with this congregation? Or if you belong to another congregation with that one, are there changes that you need to make in your life to commit? That's the thrust of it, to commit. Not just to attend, not just to casually, if nothing else is going on, if I can get there, but to put other things off so that you can strive according to the words of the Holy Spirit in Philippians chapter 1. Second, are you standing firm in gospel doctrine? Do you know gospel doctrine? I was talking earlier today with Donovan and Donovan, the way he got saved is someone sat across the table from him and says, Do, can you uh, tell me what is the gospel? He realized he couldn't. He realized he was lost and undone. He realized that he had been around churchy language, spiritual language, but he had no clue what the gospel doctrine was. God used that question to regenerate his heart, to bring him to life, and to translate him into the kingdom of grace. Do you know gospel doctrine? Are those doctrines lodged so deeply in your psyche that they dictate your time, your talents, and your treasures? If they're not, then we have no reason to believe that you're saved at all, or if you are, you're a very poor Christian. It must consume you. If it's in your psyche, if it's in your brain stem, it will consume you. And then third, are you willing to suffer for King Jesus? To stand against the ideals the world system exalts? The definitions the world system operates under? And stand for Christ's ideals and definitions even if it costs you your job, your friends, your family, and more? Are you willing to be called archaic? Are you willing to be called backward? Are you willing to be called ignorant? Are you willing to be called a racist and a misogynist? Simply for following Christ's ideals that all men, women, and children, black, white, Hispanic, Oriental, or otherwise, have one thing in common. They are all dead in their trespasses and sins. And they all need Christ to regenerate their dead hearts unto life. That is the unifying theme of the gospel. And when we are separated by gender and race and ethnicity, we are easy pickings for discord, fear, and persecution. Congregations and individuals must live distinctly from the world by standing firm and sticking together. And we need to do that now. Let's pray.